This is our, our keynote presentation as part of the Transforming Education Pillar of Startup Week. Uh, appreciate your being here. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Karen Kintos, who is Dell's first Chief Customer Officer, leading a global organization devoted to customer advocacy. Uh, Karen is also responsible for Dell's strategy and programs for uh, corporate social responsibility, diversity, inclusion, and entrepreneurship. And these are all business imperatives that, that she is passionate about. Um, and is quite important to, to Dell's customers and team members around the world. Previously at Dell, Karen served as Chief Marketing Officer. She also held executive roles in services support and supply chain at Dell, Citigroup, and Merck. And after graduating from Penn State in 1985 with her Bachelor's of Science in Supply Chain, uh, Karen earned her Master's Degree in Marketing International Business from New York University. Uh, she is on the board of Lennox International, Susan G. Komen for The Cure, and Penn State Smeal College of Business. Uh, we're glad to have Karen on campus today, so please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Karen Kintos. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you. How are you all? Do you know, I, um, I'm actually up here on campus, Kyle said, because the Smeal Board of Visitors has their biannual meeting that they do this incredibly magical thing, which is they always tie it to a football weekend which is the blue and white game or the one in, in the fall. And we had the opportunity this morning to hear from Nick Jones, the provost. And it's pretty amazing what the work that is being done campus-wide here around entrepreneurship. And you know, so many different colleges, so many different kind of organizations around have really embraced, embraced the entrepreneurial spirit. I think this startup event is incredible. I got some great feedback last night um, about some pitch sessions and um, other super interesting ideas. What I'd like to do here today is just kind of talk to you about the world of being an entrepreneur and um, more important, the, the world of being a female entrepreneur because there are some unique challenges and opportunities that, that women have and how we at Dell really really have been kind of throwing our support and, and everything uh, um, to really help women entrepreneurs be successful, grow their businesses, all of that. So I always love to start the um, presentations with a slide that kind of represents who all of our customers are at Dell. And one of the um, amazing things that my friend Irv here illustrated to me is Penn State's actually on here twice. So um, there you Exactly. There, there, there we are in the, 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 the bottom left, and here we are on the, on the right. But let me start with um, just a little bit of, about me and, and my story. So um, as Kyle mentioned, I graduated in 1985. I was actually raised in Pennsylvania. I was raised in a very small town called Penargel. Um, kind of snuggled halfway between the Poconos, Allentown, um, Bethlehem area. The town of Pinardville, Pennsylvania, when I was there, had about 3,000 people that lived in Pinardville. I graduated in a class of 90. My father was a um, agricultural management um, major graduate from Penn State. He met my mother um, here at Penn State. My mother actually had a degree in um, administrative science. Translation, she was a secretary. Uh, when she was here at Penn State, the ratio of men versus women were like three to one. So it was a great time to be a woman at, at, at Penn State because she said you always had like three or four, uh, you know, invitations to different formals and, 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 and all of that. <laughs> Anyhow, my father um, ended up in the military and then went on to be an airline pilot with United Airlines for about 30 years. So one of the great things about being a pilot back then is you really only had to work 90 hours a month, so you had a lot of time to do other things. And my father and my mother thought it'd be a great idea to raise four kids on a farm in Penargel, Pennsylvania, in a town of 3,000 people in a high school graduating class of 90. I could not wait to get out of Penargel, Pennsylvania, and I decided that I was gonna join the, uni the biggest university that was, win that was within the state of Pennsylvania, and um, came on to the campus here at University Park in, um, in 1981. Penn State was an amazing, amazing experience for me. Amazing experience. I have met um, some of my dearest friends, one of which is actually in the audience here today. 
Um, he and I had this unbelievable ability. Irv lives in, in Atlanta. I live in Austin, Texas. Um, I don't know what it is. It's, again, this kind of magic of Penn State that um, we find ourselves, quite by happenstance, being on the campus here at University Park at the same time. And that's kind of what happened a couple days ago when he said, hey, I'm going to be on campus. Are you going to be on campus? Um, but great friends, great experiences. Um, it has opened the door to so many other opportunities that, that I've I had. I was a summer intern here um, my junior to senior year with, a comp with Merck Pharmaceutical Company. Um, when I was there as a summer intern, I met my husband, my husband Tony, of um, nearly 31 years. Um, with, like I said, we've had just incredible, incredible experiences. But um, I am a mother of three. Um, I have an older son, Alex, who is 22. I have a daughter, Carmela, who is 17, soon to be 18. And I have a um, little um, girl named Ellie. So my, my son, Alex, actually got accepted into Penn State. He had accepted Penn State. Um, we were about two weeks from writing our very, very first check to Penn State, and he said, I, you know what, I really want to go look at Texas A&M. Long story short, he's at Texas A&M. Um, my middle daughter, Carmela, got accepted at Penn State. <laughs> College of Engineering um, was very much on her way to, to come, coming also to, to Penn State, and she is not now on her way to Vanderbilt, and I'm not exactly sure why, you know, Penn State. So the entire, you know, Kintos family and my mom and dad and brothers and sisters that all kind of went here and things like that are betting the farm on my 12-year-old daughter, Ellie, <laughs> um, hoping that Elise will be kind of one, one, out, of, one out of three. But um, amazing experience, lots of friends. Um, Penn State, we were just talking about this in the back, you, does an amazing job. Um, graduating students that, um, that Dell spends a lot of time here recruiting from. And we do it not just because of the caliber of the education and not because it's great in supply chain and finance and accounting and engineering and you, know, you name it across the board, um, but because the students that come out of, of Penn State are just these like well-rounded, humble, roll up your sleeves, get it done kind of leaders. And we have 200 or so of them at, um, at Dell right now in, in Austin, and you know, we will continue to recruit as, as, um, as many as, as we can. So that's a little bit about, about my story. Let me talk a little bit about entrepreneurship, and then I really want to go into kind of women, women entrepreneurs and some of the unique opportunities that we all have around, around women, women entrepreneurs. You know, one of the, I work directly for Michael, I've worked directly for Michael now for um, nearly eight years. I've been at Dell for 17. I came to Dell via Citibank. When, um, when Dell called and, and said they wanted me to come in and, and join, join their company, I said, wow, great company. I'm not moving to Texas. They said Austin is different. Um, I came with the idea that we were going to stay for two years, and, and here we are 17 years later. So Austin is an amazing city if you ever get a chance to visit Austin. I will tell you, it is not Texas. Um, it's a very un unique, unique part. But one of the things that really, really drove me to Dell was this entrepreneurial spirit. When Michael started the company 33 years ago in a dorm room in Texas, his whole vision was he could see the potential that technology could, could deliver. And it wasn't about, you know, it wasn't about the stock that's, you know, split, you know, hundreds of times during that kind of 30-year journey and, and all of that. He could see the role that technology could enable, whether it's healthcare, whether it's education, whether it's entrepreneurs. Um, you think about technology is everywhere now. And um, none of that would have happened without the vision of, a 18-year-old guy in a college dorm room who basically said, I can figure out a better way to get technology into the hands of our customers. I can do it better, faster, cheaper. Um, it sh he's, he has said it all along, you know, technology should not be a privilege, it should be a right. Everyone should have access to technology and all of what technology can, can enable. 
One of the other unique things about working at Dell and working for the, an individual who is today the only founder CEO of a technology company that is still running a technology company um, is, how, is how we believe in, in, in the role of entrepreneurs. You know, 70 to 90 percent of all jobs that are created around the world are not created by big global companies like Dell or Microsoft or even Facebook or even those companies right now. It's the next Dell. It's the next Facebook. It's the next Uber. Um, 70 to 90 percent of the jobs that that um, that are out there are created by fast growing entrepreneurs. One of the things that's personally fascinating to me and even fascinating to, to, to Michael and some of the leaders that we have across, across the company is there's not enough people at a policy administration level, whether it's in Washington or whether it's in other places around the world, that are throwing their weight behind fueling the small business entrepreneur success story. And we realized that seven or eight years ago, and we said, we need to do something about it. We need to put, you know, help them with their technology, help them with mentoring, help them with access to things that they can access to take their dreams and globally scale it at an unprecedented rate because of the, the, the role that technology plays. So we believe in the entrepreneur. We believe in advocating on their behalf. We're in places like Washington and the European community and Belgium and places like that from a policy administration perspective. And I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing in the area of, of women entrepreneurs. Um, we have about 10 million entrepreneurial customers that we serve each and every year. Companies like Uber, Dropbox, um, Airbnb, the next Airbnb, the next Dropbox, Splunk, you, you know, you kind of name it. They all started as Dell customers. And one of the unique value propositions that we have with, with, with entrepreneurs is, A, we understand them because it's part of the DNA of the company, the, the, you know, the role that, that the company has had, the role that Michael has had. But probably more important is we can reach them like nobody can. We're the only company that can do business direct with these entrepreneurs. And a lot of these entrepreneurs don't have access to big IT organizations. And entrepreneurs generally are not IT professionals. They understand technology, but they don't want to be bogged down with, you know, how do I think about building a data center? How do I think about giving, you know, securing my data? How do I think about, you know, getting um, tablets and phones and PCs into the hands of my employee base? And they want a company that can, that can do it. And that's um, a big reason why we believe in them. And we believe in them because of the, the, the role that they play around, around the world. Um, we've done a lot of work in the area of, of entrepreneurship. Um, here's a couple, a couple of, of key examples. So about a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, the United Nations was on this journey of approving their sustainable development goals for the next 15 years. And those sustainable development goals are a set of about 15 goals. Um, and they basically um, serve as the world's to-do list for the next you know, decade or so. They approached us and they said, hey, we really want a global advocate for entrepreneurship. We want somebody at the private sector level, somebody that has the brand and the cachet of really understanding entrepreneurship. And Michael stepped into that particular role. And we got goal eight, which was one of the goals that, um, that the United Nations and all of the member countries had passed, to basically say investing in entrepreneurs is the right thing to do. And now we're working with 150 countries around the world to help them figure out how do they invest in this, this um, amazing group of, of you know, biz business leaders, owners um, around, you know, around the globe. We have an entrepreneur in resident. Her name is Elizabeth Gore. Um, she's our second entrepreneur in resident. She does not work for Dell, but she, you would think she works for Dell. She's on the road all the time. She would actually be here talking to you about this if she wasn't in New York at a Vanity Fair event advocating on behalf of, of female, female entrepreneurs. But she's our mouthpiece around entrepreneurship. And she's out, she's talking to Inc. Magazine, Fast Company, 
um, striking up partnerships with other companies that really care about um, entrepreneurship. She is kind of the face to other entrepreneurs. She was the entrepreneur in resident at the United Nation. Um, and she's a huge, huge kind of proponent and um, PR kind of mouthpiece, if you will, for, for all of us. We've done a lot of work in the area of kind of policy. I'll talk a little bit about that from a female perspective in the work that we did with, with, uh, with President Trump and, and currently with Ivanka Trump on really advocating on behalf of, of female entrepreneurs. We're in, with, in, in Washington to influence some of the policies that, that really make it hard for an entrepreneur to scale their business. Some of which today, we were actually talking about this last night, is the healthcare policy and how burdening that is for companies that are trying to you know, grow and, and, um, and start their business. And then finally, an area that's near and dear to my heart is a new program and initiative that, that we started called the Dell Women's Entrepreneur Network, which started about eight years ago. And the reason we, we really pivoted hard into female entrepreneurs was for a couple of reasons. One is, as we went out and we talked to a bunch of entrepreneurs around the world, we said, how can we help you? What's standing in your way of being able to grow your business? And we found that there was kind of a consistent theme out there, but there were some unique barriers for women. Access to capital, seven, only 7% 7 of the VC funding today that is available goes to women-owned um, businesses. And that number is actually down year over year. Access to mentors, they're like, there's, there's not enough role models. Um, I want to see more role models of, of females that are success stories that, that I can learn from, that we can, you know, interact with. Um, access to mentors, people that can help them figure out, you know, how do you push through some of the mistakes and everything. And we said, there's something in this area around women entrepreneurs that we care a lot about and we want to we wanna help, help figure it out. Um, it's also pretty staggering when you look at all of the research that has been done around the role that women play in the economy, the role that women entrepreneurs, if they were actually given access to the same capabilities and resources that men could men have access to, um, the role that they play today in terms of the, the, the amount of GDP that they contribute to the economy as a whole, we have done studies and proven that if a woman starts a, a, a business, she will, over a period of time, plow 90% of what she makes back into her local community. So the pay it forward multiplier effect of, you invest in a woman entrepreneur, she can grow and scale her business, she'll take the money that she makes, she'll reinvest it back into her local community, back into education, back into making the world a better place. That multiplier effect is, um, is absolutely remarkable. Um, you know, the fact that they um, receive such a small amount of the venture capital funding that is out there um, is, is, is really a problem. It's really, really a problem. And it's a problem for a couple of, of reasons. One is because these women aren't getting the funding, you're not seeing these businesses grow, therefore you're not getting the role models and it's kind of this self-perpetuating kind of you know, motion and, and, and everything. Secondly, there's just some very historical, unconscious kind of biases that exist in the private equity um, world that we have got to figure out how to, how to break. And um, a lot of the work that we've done in partnerships with other major companies about finding sources of capital that, that these, these, these women can have access to, that we can help them um, grow and scale their, their business is so, so important for them to be able to take their business and, and really, really grow it. We did some research. Um, we call it the um, Dell Entrepreneur City Index. We basically, as we were looking at, you know, what is it that is, that is needed for, for women, um, we said, you know, there were, there, were, there were some cities that were out there that were actually doing a really, really good job enabling women, and there were some that, that weren't. 
And we went out and we looked across five attributes and we said, you know, which, which cities out there are a great place in terms of access to technology? Um, I'll come back to culture here in a second. Access to capital, access to markets, and access to, to talent. We rolled all of that up and then we ranked these cities. We've done this, this research now for about two to three years. And one of the great things about the research is it becomes something that you can go into the Chamber of Commerce in Austin, because I recently did, or to the mayor of Austin and say, you know, you're really good at these areas. You're not so good at these areas. You look at um, a plate, there's, there's actually, you know, um, cities that are up here, some of which frankly surprised us in terms of how good they are in attracting and developing and retaining and all of the infrastructure and the support that they put around, around women on, entrepreneurs. Um, Toronto was one that, that surprised us a lot. Singapore surprised us. Um, actually, one of the cities that I think is, does a great job around women entrepreneurs is New York. They have a very, very broad set of um, women entrepreneur role models across multiple industries. Um, I think Austin does a decent job, but Austin is only good in the technology area. They're not so good in you know, some of the other areas. So this became kind of a footprint and a framework, if you will, that we could go into some of these cities that we're either on the top 10 to understand kind of what they're doing and what they're doing well, and then um, also to go into cities that aren't doing very, very well to understand um, what can be done there to really catalyze the, um, the women entrepreneur um, community. Before the recent election, we um, also did a fairly significant amount of work with Vanity Fair and with some of our key customers and, and partners that really care about this area and, um, and, and did a campaign and penned a letter to, uh, we actually sent it to both presidential candidates at, at that particular time. Um, and it was a letter that was signed by nearly, you know, 100 kind of C-suite influential executives. And it was a letter that basically said, here are the things that women entrepreneurs need and what we need your help with to, um, to really accelerate the, the, the number of, of female entrepreneurs that are out there. And we laid out very explicit steps around they need to have access to capital. You need to change the policy requirements. You need to change the way that um, companies get credit for doing business with female entrepreneurs. Right now, the way that companies are incented and get credit is they have to be female owned. Well, it's really hard to be female owned when you only have access to less than 5% of the, the actual funding and the capital that's out there. So we're, we're um, working with policy administrators in Washington to to change the rules to say they could be female run or they could be female owned because there's a lot of small businesses out there that are that are female female run. So the policy side of this is is super important. Um, there are folks in the current administration that do care about this subject. Um, like I said, Ivanka Trump is 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 one of them. Dina Powell, who is one of President Trump's chief strategy advisors actually ran the Goldman 10,000 Women's Program. Um, so she is a key, key influencer and, and, and advocate when it comes to, to changing a lot of this. One of the things that I'm probably the most excited about is in our journey to help figure out, you know, how do we help these women by giving them access to capital and mentors and technology and, and all of that, we said, we need to build a place where these women entrepreneurs can come together. They can't all physically, you know, come to Austin or come to, you know, a particular city all the time. We need to build a platform where they can reach out instantaneously and connect up with someone that will meet the needs that, that they have, right? I'm a small business owner. I want to understand, you know, how to get access to legal help, how to get access to um, the right healthcare policy. How do I think about using social media? 
Um, how can I get some funding to fund the business that I have? So we've built this platform that we're actually gonna launch in, in two weeks at our Dell, Dell EMC World. Um, think of it like the Angie's List for female entrepreneurs. We call it Alice. It is a big technology platform where we have brought together 10 to 13,000 female entrepreneurs, some of the fastest growing entrepreneurs around the world. And you can go into this platform, sign up. You can um, type in what your need is and it will present back to you a series of either content or resources or individuals that you can then reach out to either virtually through social media or you know through some of the other other sites that they have access to um, or set up time that you can act you can actually you know talk to these people and 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 things like that so a virtual kind of platform that really helps to kind of connect these um, these women entrepreneurs together you know before I um, kind of close with one of my favorite stories around around you know female entrepreneurs and you know take whatever questions you have um, you know, I, I really, I really applaud you know those of you who are in the in the audience, especially at at your age, on thinking through and having the desire and the aspiration um, to really start your own business. Once a year, we bring a, a couple hundred of our most um, fastest growing female entrepreneurs together in kind of one city around the world. We've done it now for about eight years. This year, we're actually going to do it out in the West Coast in, um, in, in Silicon Valley. We generally do it outside of the United States. And I sit in that audience and in that meeting all of the time saying to myself, God, I wish I would have done it. I wish I would have done it. Um, you know, I have a lot of ideas around new businesses and new opportunities and things like that. And, you know, I've never had either the time or the courage to figure out what many of you in this audience are, are doing. A couple of years ago, we did our, our Dell Women's Entrepreneur Network event in, um, in Austin. And there was a girl by the name of Isabella Taylor, 13 years old, um, who was on stage. Isabella, Isabella T Taylor uh, came up with, at the age of 13, her own clothing line that at that point in time, um, she had just won a big deal with Nordstrom's. And in the audience were a couple hundred other female entrepreneurs that, were, that either had their own business, they were angel investors, um, kind of you name it, a, a, across the board. And this girl, because she was 13 years old, was on stage with someone else kind of talking about her, her, her journey, how she came up with the idea, you know, how her parents helped her. And then she opened it up to the audience and, and one of the, the, the women in the audience who just seemed to, to who just so happened to, to, to be in the financing area said, Isabel, if there is one thing that um, this audience can help you with, what would it be? She said, I need money. Um, she said, I just got this big deal from, from Nordstrom's. She said, honestly, I have no idea how I'm gonna fulfill this deal. I need money. And this woman, Lauren Flanagan, said, said you know what, after, after you're done here, come see me, come see Amy Millman, two of her other partners that were there, and we're going to help you. And you know they invested a million dollars in her business? Isabella Taylor is still, still designing and supplying clothes. She's 16 years old now, um, and it's expanded beyond just, just Nordstrom's. The, the, the magic that happens when you bring a group of female entrepreneurs together and their willingness and capacity to help each other, whether it's with mentoring help, whether it's in, I've seen, I have seen um, women, entre women entrepreneurs on stage in tears because their business was about to go under because of some gap that they had that they needed help with and how the network just rallied around them. And I believe it, I totally believe it. I've seen it, I've seen it happen, and I've seen the magic associated with when you can help one female entrepreneur, the way they will help each other, they will, the way that they'll you know, reinvest back in the community is, is, um, is really remarkable. 
So with that, what questions do you have or thoughts that um, around, you know, what Dell can help in the area of entrepreneurship or in the area of, of women, women, on, women entrepreneurs? If I could just mention, we do have a, a virtual audience. So if you have a question, just let us know and one of us will get a mic to you so they can all hear us. Okay, thank perfect, you, thank you. That's actually my husband, by the way. <laughs> he looks an awful lot like a lion, I'm just saying, yeah. yeah. Any thoughts or any, any questions on, how many of you are entrepreneurs here in the, or, or thinking about starting your own business or, just one, two, three, four. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> how many of you were like me where you're like, yeah, I really want to do it. I really want to do it. It's kind of hard type of thing trying to trying to figure it out. That's actually why I love, I love what Penn State's doing here because, you know, whether you decide to go into the corporate world or whether you decide to start your own business <coughs> or whether you decide to do both, I'm a firm believer there's an entrepreneurial spirit in all of us. Um, and and um, there's a real, you know, real, real great opportunity to, to, to arguably do both. Yeah, your question? I was going to ask, first of all, thank you for the, for the talk. Um, my question was uh, more on your work with Dell. Um, I think, like, personally, being able to serve user like, how they w want to be served is one of the most Im Im important part of a business. How have, like, when you work for Dell, how do you take care of your customers or your users? Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's changed and, um, and evolved a lot, right? And you think about over the last kind of 30 years, um, a lot of the business, you know, that we would do would either be, you know, let me call on you type of thing or have you call in to this, you know, all technology, all digital kind of, of world that we, that we live in. So a big part of our strategy now, clearly and in investment-wise, has been in investing in the online experience. Um, you know, the days are over, frankly, of people wanting to call a 1-800 number to get help or a 1-800 number to be able to, um, to, to, to buy something. So that kind of immersive digital experience is super important. Um, a, a fact about Dell that not a lot of people know, but 80% of the revenues that we generate and greater than 80% of the margins and the profit we generate come from our B2B business. They do not come from our consumer business. And the recent acquisition merger that we just completed with EMC, um, you know, has made those numbers even more significant on the B2B side. And our B2B customers want to do business very similar to how consumers have wanted to do business now for years. Um, so a lot of the capabilities that we build on the consumer side kind of porting over to the, the B2B side. Um, I would tell you the big, big concerns now and the opportunities we're working with our customers on is how to think about the cloud. Um, everyone thinks that every part of the enterprise environment um, with our customers is going to the public cloud. That's not true. Um, there is a role for the public cloud and there's a role for um, on-prem kind of private cloud. So we're helping our customers figure that out. And um, thirdly, security, 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 security. Security of your data, security of your environment, security of your network, security of your people. Um, that is a huge theme as we you know, look across the full portfolio of capabilities that we have and a lot of where we've made the investments to help support our, our, um, our customers. So digital, kind of online. Um, and then really into where a lot of the, the emerging technologies are going, which is a lot of what our, our B2B customers really, really care about. By the way, Penn State is a big, big customer of Dell's. They're a great customer of Dell's. Um, and one of the, the reasons why we love coming here too is they have a history of trying some, some new, innovative, and interesting things, in particular on the, re, on the research side. I mean, the, the research muscle that Penn State has and, and has invested in. I heard it loud and clear from the president last, last night about the investment they're gonna to continue to make in research at Penn State um, in the area of energy, the environment, healthcare, 
um, the educational kind of experience is really, really remarkable. Hi, um, which do you think is more important? Do you think that it's more important to um, draw in female entrepreneurs in order to gain support from other people, or do you think it's more important to build the support network in order to draw in more uh, female entrepreneurs? You know, I think it's both. I think it's both. Um, by the way, I actually feel also that um, I'm actually more optimistic today more than ever when it comes to the whole conversation around how do we get more women entrepreneurs, more women in leadership positions, more women in you know public service kind of roles. And one of the reasons that I'm more optimistic than, than ever is um, there's a whole lot of men that are now part of this conversation. I think the days are over where it's just about you know women helping women. I think it's about men helping women, women helping women, women helping men. I mean, and by the way, when I say women, there are also some very unique challenges um, when it comes to other, other diversity areas that um, have the same challenges that women have around access to mentors, role models, capital, you know, all of that um, kind of stuff. So I think you need to do both. I think you need to create places where you can come together the platform that we build from a technology perspective, the physical events that we do around the world, um, I think that's, that, that's important, but I also think it's super important that the conversations and the engagements be beyond just women, but you know, really, <laughs> hey, you're not, we are not gonna solve the, the capital issue without men becoming part of the conversation. You're not. They control 98% of, <laughs> the you know VC funding and 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 everything that's out there hi um, so I just wanted your viewpoints from someone who's worked with women entrepreneurs both as uh, like as external to the industry and as well as like entrepreneurs in the industry and uh, just what kind of trends have you observed in women entrepreneurs who are working uh, say, uh, shifting from the industry to starting their own businesses, are they more successful because they have like a greater industrial insight as opposed to uh, someone just starting off of uh, w without any idea of how the industry actually works and if that's any different for like, uh, for especially for women entrepreneurs or if it lends more credibility or something of that sort. Yeah, I think, um what I personally see with women, women, women entrepreneurs, one of the reasons that they don't get a lot of access to capital is the lack of confidence or the willingness to want to go in front of um, these kind of investment panels and pitch their business. I've watched some of it. I mean, some of it can be downright nasty. Um, it's not a very nurturing kind of environment. Um, and you gotta have, you gotta have some really tough skin, not take it personally, build the confidence, um, build the skill set that, um, um, women need to continue to work on around P and L financial savviness. It can't just be about a great idea and a great dream and everything. All you have to do is watch Shark Tank and within 30 seconds, they are all over the fi finances, right? Have you made money? You making any money? Are you growing? How much are you growing? Where are you growing? Um, when are you going to become profitable? So you got to understand and know kind of the financial P and L in and in and out. You're going to have to develop some tough skin to be able to just you know take a couple of knocks. Um, you got to be really okay because because a lot of times people are going to say no, nope, no, nope, that's a really stupid idea. I'm working with a with an, with an entrepreneur right now in Austin, and I'm absolutely convinced she's onto something. She's absolutely onto something. It's a media kind of company, um, and, and it is, she's probably pitched her business a dozen times, largely to a group of men. Um, and it, it really is about that women to women, it's a women to women kind of media thing, and they're like, why would, why would somebody pay money for this? In the meantime, I'm like, I'd pay money for it. I mean, there's, you know, all you gotta do is go on you know, some of these sites. So thick skin, P&L, those are kind of skills that I see that, that women entrepreneurs really need. 
Um, sometimes they're hard to get when you kind of come out of school or, you know, decide, decide to kind of start right in. So finding mentors that can help you with that or other learning kind of experiences that can help with that. There's a lot of women that I know that have, that have worked at companies for 10 or 15 years and then they've decided, you know what, I'm going to go do my own thing. Um, and they're, they're pretty well skilled, depending on, you know, where they worked in a company, to be able to, to go do that. And we're seeing, especially in the area of STEM, a lot of women that are plateauing um, at the age of kind of 35, 40 or, or, or so, they reach this period of time in their life where, you know, their kids are young, they don't want to stay home, they want to do something else, and starting their own business gives them the flexibility in order to go do that. And they're opening businesses, um, in, God, in some markets, they're opening businesses twice the rate that, that, um, that men are. And I think they're pretty well equipped with some of the skills being that they've, you know, worked in the corporate world for, for a period, period of time. I think one of the things that we see, too, I mean, my friend Irv and I were talking about this last, last night, as a matter of fact, is... Um, it's pretty unique to find a founder... CEO that really knows how to grow and scale his or her business. It's just, it's just a different skill set. And I think to your question, some of it is, well, where do you get those skills along the way if you've come right out of school and you really haven't worked or, you know, developed any of, <coughs> any of that, which, again, is part of what we're trying to help solve with this platform that we've built. But um, finding other places where you can take courses, you can get that skill. Hiring a team of people that actually supplement the, the, the gaps that you have if you're not a great operator um, and you're more of a, a visionary kind of, you know, founder, CEO type, um, you know, hire for, your, hire for your weaknesses. Yeah. Hi. I, I was wondering if the research shows a difference between the types of businesses that women entrepreneurs are beginning and male entrepreneurs. And if you think that that has an impact on the award of capital? Um, I think there's some of that. I think there's some of that. I, we, we tend to see women get into more consumer products, health care services areas. I will tell you at Dell, we have a venture capital funding fund. Um, it is hard to find women that are in high-tech areas that we want to invest in. Storage, virtualization, um, security. Um, these are just natural areas that, that, I, that, that men tend to gravitate to versus women. So we certainly see that. All you got to look at is, is at the statistics of women that are coming out of, of, of college um, with STEM degrees or computer science degrees, I mean, that thing is on a downward slope like, like this. We, we need to change it because there's bigger issues around pipeline and things like that that, you know, that, are, that are part of it. Um, I would say sometimes that's the challenge when you go to pitch the business, um, especially when it comes to some of the more service-related things that it's not really a product, but it's a service. So, you know, how do you visualize that? How do you bring it to life to that audience so they can see what it is, how do you make money. Um, I think that's part of the storytelling that becomes really, really Im important. And I think it becomes really important for the, the, the woman to be able to talk about it in the context of, um, listen, unless you're gonna be a nonprofit, you, you wanna make money, you have to make money. You don't have to make money at the, at, at the, at, you know, on day one. But at some point in time, you wanna continue to go and scale your business, you're gonna have to figure out how to make money. So how do you monetize you know, some of that, I, I think is sometimes hard for these angel investors to, to, um, to wrap their heads around. Thank you. Hi, so I was recently in Johannesburg and I met a Penn State alum, a woman who is now an entrepreneur in Johannesburg. 
and she was in a lot of distress because she has been turned down by her investors a couple of times and she was in fact looking at help from students like us who are studying to see what things are upcoming. So the technology platform that you spoke about, Alice, so does it have any mechanism by which you can have regional cohorts or groups where women entrepreneurs say in Johannesburg, that's not a very um, you know, developed country or like India, for example, what kind of help can we can they get regionally? Because the challenges that she faces, administrative yeah. or anything else, are very specific to that region. So how can we help regions like these? Yeah, no, it's a great question. We, we actually, last year, I wonder if she was there. Last year, we actually did our Dell Women's Entrepreneur Network event in Cape Town. Okay. Her name is Lindy Wei. She's a Penn State alum from 1989. Interesting. I should get her con get contact information. So the, this platform, Alice, initially um, will roll out in the U.S. and then we'll take it to you know the next kind of 10 markets and and those types of things. But that's not to say that we can't figure out how to help connect her up with that group of um, female entrepreneurs that are in the 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 country of South Africa. As a matter of fact, I don't know. Um, Seven Sisters Winery, you guys ever heard about Seven Sisters Winery? Um, they're out of South Africa. It's actually Seven Sisters that actually started the winery. Um, they named their wines and their different variation of their wines actually after the sisters' names. Um, they could not break into the South African market. They, la they, could, they landed a deal with American Airlines who serves their wine in, in business class and first class, but they could not break into what is a male-dominated um, wine industry in South Africa. And um, we're actually helping um, them, to, you know, help to kind of expand their business, got them into the network. They actually came and spoke at the event and talked about some of the unique challenges and everything that we had. We had the South African head of small business that was there. She talked to these women about, you know, how they can kind of grow and scale their business in in um in south africa so um yeah i'd love to get her name and contact and see sure. and see how we can help her thank you that's awesome a penn state grad in johannesburg as an entrepreneur that's awesome karen can i get two questions in sure so um, my first question is um what what strategies uh, or if there was one thing that you did to help position you for success in business the other question is, what was, what was the most helpful thing someone else did for you, man or woman? But can you share that with us? Yeah. I'll tell you a story. This is, this is actually a true story. It kind of answers both, both of those. So my friend Irv Grossman here, um, I, I, I came to Penn State with the idea that I wanted to be an accounting major. And I took the two introductory accounting classes and I did fine. And then I took the god awful intermediate accounting course and I barely broke a C. Never studied for anything more in my life to barely break a C. Um, my friend Irv came walking down the hall one day and said to me, Hey, just heard about this great class called Business Logistics. Now they call it Supply Chain. Talked to, um, taught by Dr. Coyle, who's a legendary kind of instructor here at Penn State. Um, take the class with me. And I'm like, yeah, okay, fine. I, you know, I needed you know, business credits and, and that type of thing. Fell in love with supply chain management because it was cross-functional. You got to see everything that was happening in a company from marketing to manufacturing to all of that. Ended up changing my major from accounting to supply chain management. When I called my father to tell my father I was changing my major from accounting to supply chain management, he told me I was going to be driving a forklift for the rest of my life <laughs> and I said you don't understand that it's not really about warehouse management so um, in a very very small but significant way I actually credit this individual right here for getting me out of the accounting major you know path to um, an area like like supply chain you know I would say beyond that um, you know I think one of the, the the biggest things that women can can do um, is really work on confidence. Um, I think confidence is the best outfit that you can put on in the morning and you can go to work. Um, I worked for a lot of really, really confident leaders over the, the years and they've taught me that. They've taught me the, um, 
the, the magic of, you know, first impressions. They've taught me things around how to be effective, how to collaborate, how to influence, how to deliver. So I think the ment you know, I've had a lot of really good mentors. Um, and then the other piece that I would, I would tell you is somewhere in your career, you're going to realize that you have advocates that um, are advocating on your behalf. You, had, you had, have no idea they were advocates, and you should take, take full, full advantage of, of, of them. When, when Michael asked me to um, work directly for him eight years or so ago, actually in the chief marketing officer role, the biggest advocate at that time actually was, was my boss at that time, who was a Penn State grad. Um, a gentleman by the name of Paul Bell still comes up on campus. He's on the board of, of the IST, so-called you know, board of a visitor equivalent. Um, our CMO at that time had um, pretty ab abruptly decided that she was going to kind of do something else. And Paul's, I was working for Paul directly. I was running marketing for him in the public sector. And, and he you know, called Michael and said, um, Karen would be the best person in, in, that, in that job. And when I accepted the job, Paul was like, see, I told you, I told you I had the right, you know, the right, the right person. So I think mentorship, advocacy, confidence, um, having great friends like Irv who, you know, pull you out of an area that you, that you think you're going to be good at, but you're not good at it and you don't love it. Um, you got to love what you do. You have to love what you, you have to love what you do. You have to love who you work for. Um, and if those things aren't quite clicking and, and, and working for, for you, then you ought to really sit back and reflect on, is it time to make a change? Am I in the right, am I in the, you know, the wrong major, the wrong company, the wrong boss? Um, and have the courage and the confidence to believe in yourself and know, and know um, when to make the change. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions for Karen? So, uh, <coughs> excuse me, given your um, trajectory through large organizations, do you have any comments on entrepreneurship? So that is, how does an organization foster kind of entrepreneurial spirit within the organization itself? Yeah, great, great question. As a matter of fact, we, got, we actually got that question a couple of weeks ago. We were at a big CIO session. Um, it's really hard, especially, you know, as a, as a company that starts to hit that, I think it happens in that, 20, 30, 40 billion dollar range where growth is slowing down. Um, how do you continue to, um, to do that? We're, actually, we're, we're fortunate because we work in the tech sector. Um, you work in the tech sector, you have to, I, I, I think you actually have to be, you have to have this, this, this um, entrepreneurial kind of spirit because it's constantly, constantly changing. So I think that's a big advantage that we have. That being said, you got to create capabilities where you're rewarding and incenting folks to take a risk. You have to carve money out that you're going to invest in new ideas. And if they fail, it's going to be okay. So there's a real kind of cultural element to it. Um, I think you have to, I, you know, candidly, I think you got to lean hard in the area of, of, of technology and all of what technology can do. We did a piece of research about a year or so ago um, to a group of Fortune 500 companies. I forget the exact number, but it was staggering. It was like 60 to 70 percent of them um, were concerned that they were going to go out of business in the next five years. I mean, you look at the companies today that are part of the Fortune 50 and who those companies were 10 or 15 years ago, look at the disruption that's happening in, in the retail industry. Um, you know, companies like, like Walmart that were just, you know, killing it from a growth, expansion, customer acquisition perspective and, you know, what, what, what they have to do. So I do think it takes, you know, leadership, culture, rewards recognition, special programs and things like that to, um, to, to incent it. I think the, 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 frankly, I think the industries that, that have longer term decision cycles, um, it's harder. You know, you think about the pharmaceutical industry that, you know, generally makes decisions kind of around what products to, to invest in on a five, 10 year kind of tranche. Um, 
you know, are I think are more more challenged when it comes to comes to that. Thank you. I think GE's done a great job, by the way. I think um, Jeffrey Jeff Immelt, Beth Comstock, who you know is kind of their CMO, but also running their lighting division. Um, She's done a lot of great work. You should go take a look at it. I'm really driving kind of an, an innovative kind of spirit and approach. She's doing a lot of stuff with makers and, um, you know, the work that we're doing with them around big data analytics with Predix and, you know, how do you support, support all of that. So I think if you look within companies, you, you see it. And I, th I think you certainly can find the larger companies that have it and then, you know, some of the, some of the other ones that um, it's, it's more of a challenge. Anything else? So what advice, uh, you had four or five hands come up on the question about who's an entrepreneur. What advice would you have for the, for the remainder of that group thinking about or maybe not thinking and even considering an entrepre entrepreneurial move? Like that sounds like a big scary thing. Yeah. Well, how many of you actually have an idea or have come up with an idea or something that you've thought about that you're like, this would be a great idea? Really? My God, I think about one like every single day. I'm always like, you know, some unmet need that's out there, you know. I know this is being videotaped, but this is a true story. I mean, I was, I was, my husband thought I was absolutely out of my mind. I was sitting, probably shouldn't tell us when the tape's running, but what the heck. I, you know, I was sitting at church on Easter Sunday and, and you know, we go to church pretty routinely. There's a lot of people that don't go to church very routinely on, a, on Easter Sunday. And I turned to him because we couldn't find a seat. And I said, you know, there's, you know how you have this like save the table app that you have in, in restaurants? I said, there should be save a pew. That's exactly, that's exactly what I said. And um, first of all, my 17-year-old daughter, Carmela, when I was telling her this story, do you know what she said to me? What is a pew? <laughs> oh my God, Carmela. I'm like, you know, I know they have chairs now in these churches. And you know, I'm, I'm always thinking about these, you know, ways that you can make life better, solve an unmet need. Um, I don't know, my advice would be, hey, I think everybody out there, you know, has some kind of entrepreneurial bug in them. Um, it, it all depends on, you know, when you want to kind of unleash it, when you feel comfortable doing it. I think if you are a little bit uncertain, parallel pathing it, um, it can be super helpful. There's a lot of companies that, you know, you don't have to work 80 hours a week. You can still, there's a, there, there's a number of people at, at Dell that are doing businesses on the side, new ideas that they're doing, things that they come to us with to say, hey, you know, we've thought about this, what about that um, type of thing. So it, I, it is scary. Um, I think you have to have a stomach for it, candidly. Um, I don't know, you've been an entrepreneur for a long time. I mean, what advice would you give these guys? <laughs> he didn't know I was going to make my a only piece of my, my only piece of advice is um, don't see the wall in front of you. Um, there's a lot of reasons why you'd like to stop at the wall. Got to go over it, under it, around it, through it. You just cannot, if you believe in what your idea is, you just got to find a different way of making it happen. I mean, I can tell you, I, I started a consulting firm and ran it for five years before I got acquired. And I can tell you the number of times that we almost ran out of business. And um, you just, and you just can, can, you just, if you believe in yourself and believe in what you're doing, you got to find a way of making it happen. It's the only advice I give. Yeah. yeah. Hey, there was a time where Dell, where, where Michael didn't think he was going to make payroll. Um, it's a pretty scary thing when you have all these people kind of working for you and you're like they're dependent on you. You have to, you have to um, be able to make payroll. He, you know, he tells this story all the time about very early on. He um, came into work one day. He was a little bit late. There were a lot of people, not a lot, he, I don't know, 50 employees or whatever he had at that point in time that were, um, they were standing outside the door. They, they weren't going into work. And, he said, well, why are you not at work? And he realized because he was the only one that had the key to the door. Um, so, you know, there are some things in, in, in you know, that, that journey that are, that are scary, new. You're going to get into new areas. The other thing I would tell you is I find the entrepreneurial community to be incredibly supportive of each other. Incredibly supportive. You just have to find that, that, that network. 
that um, that can help you. But if I had to do it again, I would have uh, I would have jumped on on my ideas faster. I would have parallel tracked them in terms of working for a company and um, and also being able to find places where where you can do it. Um, yeah, and then you'll you know I think find different times in your career or your your journey where it works better than than others as you think about kind of how that whole whole whole, whole system for you needs to work. Well, that's a really great way to close out the session today. Please join me in thanking Karen for her time today. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for for joining us for Startup Week today. Um, and so we have uh, had events all week long and culminating this evening. Um, and so thank you for participating and, and, and uh, thank you, Karen, for joining us. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.